Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to episode 10 of the Talking Sira podcast. In our last episode, we spoke about the attack on Islam faced by the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and we explained how this attack was both physical and ideological. So the physical attack consisted of torture, persecution, uh, boycotting of the Muslims, and even killing uh, of, of some of the Sahaba. And and it also consisted of the ideological attack, which was you know mockery of the deen, even mockery of the Messenger وسلم, himself, propaganda efforts, and you know the Quraysh the Quraysh went to every effort they could to hinder the dawah. Um, and one of the things we did is we demonstrated how the attack faced by the Muslims at the time of the Messenger وسلم, were in fact very similar to the attack we face today. And, you know, there can be clear comparisons we can make. And, you know, the fact that we still have the mockery of the deen. Uh, only this month, you'd say, we've we've been reminded of uh, some of the cartoons draw, drawn of, of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, the Qur'an being, you know, and Billah, it's been uh, ripped to shreds and, you know, lots of disgusting things happening to, to mock Islam. Um, and also the physical attack, you know, we find the Ummah still being uh, persecuted and oppressed all around the world constantly on a daily basis you could say so this uh, similarity we could draw and one of the reasons we made this comparison is that we see that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam faced uh, all of this oppression and attack against islam and he continued on his mission and he found a way to overcome these challenges and and you know, come to security and um, have a system in place that would mean the Muslims did have that protection and security. So knowing this, and we will obviously go into more detail of how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this, but we all know that this happened. And by knowing this, uh, it gives us the confidence that if we are to tread that same path, that same path of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions, we will be able to overcome the challenges that we face today. There's nothing new. It's not a new phenomenon that we are facing these attacks, um, both physical and ideological. They're you know very similar was faced by the Muslims of the past, right from day one when the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given the revelation. So again, we highlighted why we shouldn't be distracted by following a different course of action, trying to find solutions that are not from Islam. In fact, we have the solution in front of us and we need to refer back to the Quran and the Sunnah and back to the life of the Prophet وسلم, to find out how he, the Messenger وسلم, and his noble companions overcame these challenges. So this really um, links in with what we want to discuss today. Um, I want to really focus in depth on one of the issues we spoke about last time but um, go into a bit more detail. And that is basically how the Quraysh boycotted and embargoed the Muslims um, in Mecca. And eventually they kind of banished them to the valleys. And there's two reasons really I want to focus on this today. And what number one is that you'll find that many books of Sira, especially the modern books of Sira, they don't really cover this event um, in great detail. It's mentioned, uh, a few paragraphs maybe, but you'll find that there's not much detail on this event. And I think that's quite unfair because this boycott, this embargo, actually lasted three years. And we know that the Meccan period is only 13 years. So a significant amount of time uh, the embargo occurred. And so I think this is the first reason I want to kind of touch on it in a bit more depth and explain uh, what really happened and the environment surrounding it. And number two really is that when looking into it and reading about this event and doing my research, uh, I find that there's some really key lessons that we can, you know, re- key lessons that we can take from the this event and, and how the Messenger of uh, overcame this event in our lives today. Um, there are some clear comparisons we can make and as you know, this series, that's a really important priority for us that we want to make those comparisons so that we can see the pra- practical implementation 
in our lives and it's not just a story of the seerah, it's not just information, it's something that we can practically apply in our reality today. So, you know, this is the re these are the reasons really I want to cover this event in more depth. So, what were the events leading up to the boycott and the embargo? So, it was around the, the you know, the sixth or seventh year of prophethood according to uh, the evidence that uh, as we spoke about in the last episode you know the environment the environment against the muslims became very hostile and very harsh and the the quraysh and the enemies of islam were seeking any opportunity to hinder the dawah and that as we spoke about they did, they went to every length possible uh, to physically oppress the muslims and also ideologically harm islam and with this environment, this very hostile and harsh environment, the Quraysh obviously they were attacking the uh, companions and, and they, they, they initially, initially targeted the weak companions. But when they realized that nothing was really changing and the Muslims, you know, really become, became even stronger in their deen, the Quraysh realized that they needed to do something more. So they started to physically attack the Messenger, and we spoke about some of the examples in, in in the in the episode we have um, we, last episode we had um so for example uqba ibn abu mu'it um, who is known to be like one of the most ardent enemies of islam the, not just ardent but wretched like he would do anything possible uh, and he just had this wretched nature and we spoke about how he one time when he saw the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam praying uh, next to the kaaba and when he was in sujood he took the intestines of a camel, of a dead camel, and he placed it on top of the Messenger وسلم, while he was praying. And, you know, this was a really uh, a disgusting act, but also um, it, it was, it was dishonourable to the Messenger وسلم, who, who wasn't a nobody, he still was, uh, had, you know, he wasn't a weak Muslim, he was from uh, one of the greatest tribes in Quraysh. So this was a, a dishonourable act, and something that was ignoble really and Fatima who was a, just a child had to uh, take the intestines off her own father while, while he was praying so and and we all, we also spoke about how uh, the person the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam made dua against Uqba ibn Mawit and also the the leaders of Quraysh when this happened he was very harsh in his words against them so even when this was happening, you know, it was becoming harsh and they started to physically take action against the Messenger Wasallam. The Muslims continued to become stronger. The Messenger himself carried on with his mission and it didn't stop him. It didn't distract him. So the Quraysh, again, they recognized that they had to do something more. They had to, you know, intensify their efforts to bring an end to the mission. And that's when they came up with the idea of bringing an end to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself i.e. killing the messenger the, the, the voices started to become louder about killing the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so in another incident we found that uqba ibn abu muid the same the same wretched ignoble character he attempted to strangle the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam while he was praying with his um, like his shawl or his scarf he, he tried to strangle the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam near the kaaba but you know to almost near death, uh, the Messenger of some couldn't breathe. But alhamdulillah, you know, Abu Bakr uh, walked past and s interceded. Um, and he saw what was going on and he stopped Uqba from doing what he, this wretched man was doing to the Messenger of Wasallam. And it was that famous um, words that we, we all know that Abu Bakr said in this occasion where he said that, do you want to kill a man just because he, he says, my Lord is Allah? And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself actually says in the Quran, Rajulan an Yaqula Rabbi Allahu which which translates that the same, you know, exactly the same words. Do you wish to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah? So again, this shows how the Quraysh were becoming even more wretched, even more intense, you know, intensifying their efforts against the Muslims and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. And you could see that they were getting closer and closer to actually trying to kill the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, what you find even as, you know, just before the boycott, the Quraysh approached Abu Talib, uh, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one final time. They thought, let's see whether we can convince 
um, his uncle. And it was a strange offer, really, but um, they offered Abu Talib another boy in exchange for the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Very strange and something you think, why would they even offer that? And even Abu Talib himself, or it was really strange and didn't think that was a fair bargain. Uh, so they said, oh, Abu Talib, you know, we've bought you a smart boy uh, he, in the bloom of his youth. Uh, you could use his mind, his strength, and take him as your son ex- in exchange for your nephew. Um, who, who, And your nephew, who has run counter to your religion, bought about social discord, found fault with your way of life. They were trying to really highlight the things uh, that, that the Messiah Sassam disagreed with Abu Talib, obviously his belief. Um and 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 when when they say exchange for another boy, what they mean is they another boy would be exchanged for the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that they could kill the messenger subhanallah. So they offered this, and Abu Talib obviously responded, thinking uh, it was a, an absurd offer. Uh, and he said, you know, this is an unfair bargain. Do you think I'm going to give up my son? Because he saw the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam as his son. He brought him up up when he was young, uh, and he was an orphan. So. It was a, even though in relationship wise, you know, his uncle nephew relationship, but in reality, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was literally like a son to Abu Talib, and he was saying, you know, do you think I'll give you my son to kill him? By Allah, this is incredible. This is deluded, and he refused, obviously. But what Abu Talib realized uh, when the Quraysh made this offer is that the Quraysh had real intentions to kill the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this was serious and something needed to be done. And th- in this environment, you know, um, the, the Abu, um, Abu Talib um, wanted to, to uh, avoid a situation where the Messenger Sallam would be harmed or even threatened by his life, uh, threatened to be killed. Um, but just before speaking about the boycott, um, there were some events uh, that are linked to the environment that we're speaking about um, that was a benefit to Islam. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it assisted Islam and assisted the Dawah. And that is the conversion of two of the greatest in Islam, which we can touch on a little bit today. So um, most of you will know that in this period, in the sixth or seventh year of prophethood, uh, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib and Omar bin Al Khattab both embraced Islam, and it really shows that sometimes when the environment gets very harsh and it gets very um, hostile, often the hearts and eyes of the non-Muslims can open, especially with those those who have uh, you know an ounce of insincerity in their hearts. Uh, they will open their eyes and and see that there is a uh, you know, unbalanced attack on Islam. And you find it there, obviously, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the, the, the Islam of Hamza and Omar. But even today, when it came to, for example, uh, the war on Islam and the war on terror, um, you know, many, many people actually looked into Islam further uh, because they saw the attention that Islam was having um, on the news, on the media, and uh, many, many actually embraced Islam for this. So it just shows that Often, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his hikmah, if, even when the, the Islam is facing an attack, uh, there are sometimes some, you know, blooms out there and some positive stories. So this was the case in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where when the, you know, the situation became really harsh, um, the Muslims were aided by the Islam of these two giants of Islam, you could argue. So just to cover off uh, the, the conversion, really, and you know everyone should know this, so I won't go into too much detail, but try to highlight some of the lessons we can take from this. Uh, when So the, the conversion of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, uh, the story really goes that uh, he was uh, once away and Abu Jahl ran into the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he bumped into him. And because of this environment that we were speaking about, he began to curse the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and very you know, harshly. It wasn't even like his normal curses. It was to the greatest extent possible. He was cursing him, insulting the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just the Messenger, he was insulting his tribe as well. Uh, to And in some uh, narrations, he even attacked the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it was a very hostile and insulting attack on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and no one was there to defend 
Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And there were a few women, slave women, that were around the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam when this happened. So when they uh, saw Hamza, when Hamza was returning from his hunting uh, expedition, the women really taunted Hamza, and they uh, were were saying to him, you know, this is your nephew. How you know where is uh, where is your honor? How can you not be here to defend Banu Hashim and and defend the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So when Hamza obviously was surprised and he he asked what happened, and they explained explained to him that Abu Jahl went on a uh, you know a real mad one really, and and he insulted the messenger like he'd never done before. So when Hamza heard this, obviously this is uh, his nephew, and not just his nephew, they were very close. They were very close friends. So even before Islam, so and and you know it's his family, it's his tribe. So. Hamza's blood began to boil. He immediately, not changing nothing, he didn't go back home. He, with his gear, with his um, bow and arrow, he immediately marched to Abu Jahl in in front of the Kaaba, and he smacked him across the head with his bow. Um, and he said, you know, out of uh, anger, and he just blurted it out. He said, "How dare you do this to my nephew? I am now a follower of his religion." And he said this out of anger. He didn't really sincerely mean it, but he said it out of kind of pride and defense of the Prophet ﷺ and his tribe. And even it surprised him that he said it. So obviously Abu Jahl uh, was surprised with what um, Hamza had said, and his tribe even got up to defend Abu Talib, uh, Abu Jahl. Sorry, um, but when when he saw this, Abu Jahl he said, "Look, leave it. Um, you know, in fact, I have cursed his nephew like I've never done before." So, so they they sat back down. Anyway, Hamza went home, uh, re- trying to just reflect on what he had said, and the dilemma he was in. Because obviously now he's made such a big statement that he's become Muslim, he can't really go back on his word. It'd be embarrassing for someone to just go back on their word after saying this, especially he said it in front of nearly everyone, and and you know in the the marketplace right in front of the Kaaba. So in this dilemma, you know he made du'a to Allah. He kind of wanted to sincerely accept Islam, not just out of kind of pride, but really accept Islam. So he asked Allah to either show him a sign that Islam is the truth or or for, will for him to die because he couldn't face going back and saying that this was just out of pride and out of anger. Anyway, the next morning, obviously, he woke up and he did have that sincerity. He went to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was given a bit more da'wah by the Messenger of and Islam did enter his heart. He recognized that this was the truth and now he sincerely embraced Islam. He knew that this was the truth and it wasn't just out of pride and anger. He embraced Islam and it wasn't just an emotive thing. It, his his thought process, his sincere belief that was that Islam is the truth and the Messenger of Allah is indeed the Messenger of, of Allah. So with the Islam of Hamza, obviously this gave uh, a lot of support to the Messenger وسلم, and Islam itself. Um, this was the first time a senior chief of Quraysh, someone such senior, uh, so senior, had embraced Islam. And this had a massive impact on the Quraysh as well. You know, They had to now think about what they needed to do and it, again it gave a, a greater reason why the Quraysh had to do something much more severe than just the torture that they were doing, which was bad enough, really. So, just, you know, three days later, it's narrated, only three days later, subhanAllah, another major conversion took place. And that was a conversion of none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. So, this, uh, everyone obviously knows this story, and um, again, I don't want to go into any depth of this, but speak about some of the events that happened before it, and even after it, so um, we all know about the du'a that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam made um, before Umar became Muslim, and it was basically for one of the two Amars to embrace Islam, either Umar bin Al Khattab or Abu Jahl, who obviously his name is not Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl means father of ignorance, but his real name is Amr ibn Hisham. So the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted one of these to become Muslim. And we'll speak about the significance of this dua. It's not just a, a dua for the sake of it. There is some significance of why the Messenger وسلم, wanted one of the Amrs to become Muslim. So on one occasion, uh, it's uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab, he was passing by a sahabiyat called Layla, 
who was uh, preparing to leave for Abyssinia to migrate. Um, and this again, this is something we'll speak about in the next episode. Um, but during this time, the Mecha Sallam had also given permission for the first migration to Abyssinia. So anyway, Omar is uh, speaking to, or he sees Layla pack, you know, pack, packing and preparing to leave for Abyssinia. So Omar, is in his shock, he, he asks her, and has the situation become so bad that you're leaving? Um, and she she angrily responds, you know, because she she thinks how shameful for him to ask. He, she responds, you know, it's because of the likes of you that we're leaving. It's because of your hostility, your hatred and your like that we are leaving. So how can you ask this question? So to her surprise, Omar um, was shocked. And she, he, he, in fact, emphasized, um, empath, empathized with the with the Muslims and, and with her. And he made dua for her. He said, you know, may Allah give you barakah in wherever you go. So this shocked Layla and she didn't expect this from Omar who's known for his, uh, you know, being harsh and being, uh, you, know, you know, an enemy of Islam at the time. Um, and he didn't have this softened, softened stance. So when when uh, Layla saw this reaction from Omar, uh, she told her husband, you know, I, I saw a, a soft side to Omar today. Um, and she kind of hoped for him to become Muslim. And, and the husband, her husband, uh, really recognized this and he scoffed. He's, he basically said, you know, the, the donkey of Omar's father will accept Islam before Omar. Which really means it's just a saying for, it's impossible. You know, Omar cannot become Muslim. He's an enemy of Islam. And there's no sign of him becoming Muslim. So kind of get this out of your head. This is just, you're just being emotional. So how did it actually occur then? So we we, we all should know this, but uh, to summarize again, um, um, before uh, Omar's conversion, Abu Jahl was in the center of Mecca, shouting his usual abuse against the Muslims. And he said to the people that, you know, no man has caused more harm to the Quraysh and their forefathers than the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously, he, he would refer to him as Muhammad, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said that he pre- was prepared to give 100 camels and 100 pouches of silver to anyone who would kill the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, again, as we're speaking about, the, the environment was that they are now ready to kill the Messenger. They cannot stand that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is not being impacted by their other efforts and, and their persecution. So they've got to the stage where they want him dead. So Omar uh, really, he took up the challenge. <laughs> he he wanted to bring an end uh, to all this uh, ruckus that's being caused in uh, and in, in uh, Mecca. And he just wanted to bring an end to it. So he went home and he, he got his sword, he unsheathed his sword. And he went to find the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to kill him. So whilst he was going, uh, Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, he saw Omar, you know, he saw Omar with his anger, with his sword. And Nu'aym, who was secretly Muslim, he, he hadn't publicly said he was Muslim. He tried to intercede and he, he basically asked Omar what he was doing. And Omar explained that um, basically he wants to put an end to this issue and he's going to kill the Messenger. And obviously Omar, uh, Nu'aym, sorry, was shocked and he didn't want this to occur so he tried to convince Omar not to carry out this action and in desperation um, he shouldn't have really said it was a secret but in desperation he said you know you need to sort out your your own household first meaning there's Muslims in your own household why are you not sorting that problem out first so Omar obviously was shocked he he asked you know what's wrong with my household and Noam explained that you know your sister and your brother-in-law uh, Fatima and Said ibn Zaid ibn Zaid had also become Muslim. So Omar obviously he was ready to go kill the messenger, but his own sister has become Muslim, so he he's even more angry now. And he marched towards his sister's house and he approached the door and he could hear mumblings, which is obviously the Quran. Uh, Kabab ibn al Arath was the teacher of Fatima and Said and he was teaching them the Quran. So when he heard this, he Omar banged on the door asking, what's this noise? Uh, and Kebab quickly hid. And Fatima hid, hid the verses of the Quran that they were reciting. So Omar entered and said, you know, what are these noises that I'm hearing? And obviously Fatima and Said they denied. They said, it's nothing, you didn't hear anything. But Omar, he insisted because he knew he heard something. 
Um, and then he said, I've heard that you've embraced Islam. And again, Fatima and Say- Saeed, they denied the claim. They they said, no, no, we haven't become Muslim. It's a lie. And, you know, they tried to still contain the secret. Um, so obviously, Omar got angry because he had heard this. So in his anger, he went to hit Saeed and he accidentally hit his own sister, who whose lip uh, began to bleed. And in this uh, anger, both Fatima and Saeed, they, they got angry and said, yes, we do believe in Allah and, and that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. You do as you please. So they admitted that they had become Muslim. But when Omar saw the blood flowing from his sister's lips, he softened because it was his sister and he didn't mean to hurt her and he felt sorry. So he calmed down a little bit and he asked, you know, let me see th- these verses. What are these verses that are causing so much of a scene in 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 Mecca and amongst the Quraysh? So Fatima obviously said he needs to do ghusl, he needs to be purified before he can touch the mushaf. So anyway, he, he purified himself, the ghusl came back and he recited these verses, the famous verses of Surah Taha. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but he, he read it and he realized that this isn't something th- something to be afraid of. And the truth entered his heart. He embraced Islam, knowing that this was the truth and he was convinced. So obviously, when he said he believed in it, Kebab ibn Arath, he, he came out of hiding and he was elated. And he told Omar about the dua of the Prophet وسلم, that, you know, he wanted one of the Omars to become Muslim. So again, Omar... Um, said, okay, I'm Muslim, but I want to go on to, you know, go to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself and take the Shahada. Um, so Kababi took him to Darul Arkham, which is obviously a secret place and a secret meeting place. And, you know, he had his sword uh, still in his hand. So he knocked on the door and they saw who it was and they saw Omar with his sword. So they, the, the Sahaba, they got shocked and they were thinking, why is Kabab bringing Omar to their secret meeting place? Uh, but anyway, Hamza showed no fear, as as, as we know Hamza. Uh, and he, he said, look, let him come in. If he's accepted Islam, then alhamdulillah. And if he hasn't, we'll use his own sword to kill him. So he entered the house and the Prophet ﷺ himself grabbed Omar by the collar and asked him, you know, why are you here? Explain why you've come. And Omar told the Messenger of that he'd come and he'd accepted Islam. So again, it just highlights that um, in this environment of hostility, in this environment of uh, hatred against Islam and where persecution is at its height, you can still have uh, some blessings and the Messenger of Allah and the Muslims did with both the, the, you know, the Islam of Omar and Hamza. And another thing to highlight is, uh, we spoke about it earlier, that um, the dua of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that either one of the Omars to become Muslim whether it be Omar bin, Ab- uh, Abd- um, Omar bin al-Khattab or Abu Jahl and the reason he made this dua one well, of the hikmas is that he recognizes the influence in society um, and even though we may feel like these are the enemies of Islam they would never embrace Islam we shouldn't lose hope because if there's an ounce of sincerity, then they will become Muslim. Obviously, there's the ardent enemies of Islam that never ever will become Muslim. And Abu Jahl is one of them. He never became Muslim. But um, the dua itself just shows that the Messenger wanted someone of influence so that it would aid the da'wah. And this is something that we should do in our da'wah as well. When we're giving da'wah to Muslims and um, especially to Muslims today, we you know we, there's, an, there's an enough of us in terms of our da'wah to resume Islam and bring about the security and protection that we need, um, we do need influential influential voices to speak on our behalf. Whether that be the scholars, whether that be people that are influential in society, it's important that we have um, you know, these, these people to help the cause. And Omar was, was that. Omar, when he became Muslim, um, it is said that the Muslims found it so much more easier to publicly um, worship and show that they are Muslim and to go to the Kaaba. And this is why he was given the name Al Farooq. Uh, Omar was one, once asked, How did you get the title Al Farooq? And, uh, you know, what Far- Al Farooq means the one who divides truth from falsehood. And he said, The Prophet ﷺ gave me this title uh, when we marched to the Kaaba, headed by the two rows, me and Hamza. And for the first time, we prayed jama'ah in public. So 
the Prophet ﷺ said, you have now separated and allowed Islam to be practiced without fear. And thus he named him al Farooq, the, the separator. So this just shows that when Omar became Muslim, because of his influence, because of his power and the fear that he instilled in others, that the Muslims had some more security and protection. And the fact that we should also look to people of influence, people that will aid the da'wah to target them and ensure that they are speaking on the behalf of uh, Islam. And it is it's a crying shame that we do find some of these people who carry these positions of influence and titles are actually doing the opposite. Um, whether you know some people are doing it intentionally and, and some maybe doing it unintentionally, um, you do find this. Uh, some some scholars, not everyone, but some scholars have taken their position uh, gain credibility but now speak you know against islam and 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 they give fatwas and they give uh you know the, they stand on podiums and speak against islam and we've had some clear examples in the recent uh weeks uh, whether it be um bin Baya of the um the uh you know forum for peace who in uae um you know he's an influential person people did look up to him before this and in the past and but he's now using his position to aid you know the enemies of islam you could argue and and there's other people on his board as well i don't need to name every one of them but there are people of influence whether it be the leaders or some of the scholars even in the haramain who are supporting the regime and supporting uh, messages that go against islam and this has the opposite effect and we just pray that there are other voices out there who can counter this and inshallah the muslims can see through uh, some of these um, claims and, and 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 I would say that they have a lot of Muslims have seen through this and they are calling out those who are speaking against Islam Alhamdulillah so just to move back onto the seerah so obviously with the conversion of Hamza and Omar this did have a positive impact on the da'wah and definitely aided the Muslims but there was still that fear um, that Abu Talib had that the the life of his nephew was at risk uh, the life of the Prophet ﷺ was at risk and he was being threatened uh, to be killed. So he, de- he deliberated, uh, you know, knowing that there were certain incidents where the Quraysh had actually physically tied to, tried to kill the Messenger ﷺ or intended to kill, even with the case of Omar's story, you know, it's c- quite clear there was an intent to kill the Messenger ﷺ. So Abu Talib had these fears and he was right to have these fears because the Qur- Quraysh had started to lay down a carefully concocted plan to kill the messenger وسلم, and they banded together as tribes uh, as as leaders uh, to put their plan into effect so abu talib when he recognized that this was happening he called his kinsfolk he called bani hashim and banu abdul muttalib um, abdul muttalib um, and told them and said to them look we need to immunize and defend our nephew we need to make sure that he's not threatened and uh, protect him because he's part of our tribe and all of them really supported this whether they were believers or, or non-muslims they, they supported this um, except for one person obviously Abu, Abu Lahab who was an ardent enemy of Islam and he always sided with the leaders of Quraysh who were enemies um, so he disagreed but most of the other or I'd say all of the other um, kinsfolk of Banu Hashim and Bani Abdul Muttalib they agreed with Abu Talib that they needed to do something to protect the Prophet. And because of this, because they had come out and said that they are going to protect the Messenger Wasallam, and they're not going to give up the Messenger to the Quraysh, uh, the, the Quraysh, enemies of Quraysh, the leaders, um, they, um, enemies within Quraysh, sorry, the, the leaders, the likes of Abu Jahal, um, Al-Walid bin Mughaira, these leaders, they recognized that Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib, they are protecting the Messenger Wasallam. So they held a meeting in a place called Wadi al muhassib and they agreed a pact or a, um, you could, yeah, a pact or an agreement amongst themselves against Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. You know, they basically put this agreement together, a social and economic embargo, until they gave up the messenger. And not only did they do this, they thought about it strategically and thought about all the... And we will speak a bit more about what it contained. And they hung this up in the Kaaba itself, in a parchment. So, 
in this, obviously, now this embargo that had been placed on Banu Hashim and then extended to uh, Banu Abdul Muttalib, um, Abu Talib realized this is hostile and, and he decided to take his tribe outside uh, to the valley of Mecca, outside of the eastern outskirts of Mecca. Um, and, you know, they were confined to this kind of side uh, side of the desert uh, called Shib of Abu Talib. And this embargo, this boycott of economic and social boycott, this lasted around two to three years. So you can imagine the dire situation. In the middle of the desert, the Muslims were basically being starved to death. They, they were being starved. And, and, you know, it was really uh, extreme and it was really hostile and... Uh, many many Muslims and and even non-Muslims of the, of the tribes of Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib were even dying. So, what did it include? Let's give it go into a bit more detail. Everybody knows it's an economic and social boycott, but what did it actually include? Um, it started off with Banu Hashim. So it was initially Banu Hashim, which is the tribe of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then when the Quraysh realized that Abu Abdul, Banu Abdul Muttalib were also going to protect the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they extended it to them. They said the boycott applies to both Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib and the Muslims. So this boycott applied, whether they're non-Muslim or Muslim, to those two tribes. Um, and there's very clear reasons for this, because they know that tribal society is very strong in uh, Arab, uh, the Arabian Peninsula at the time. Um, and if you can kind of, um, what's the word, exile or even kind of uh, cause a barrier um, from the rest of the Quraysh, then what can happen is that that tribe itself may feel hostile towards the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there may have been voices within them that wanted to give up the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they wanted to create this kind of situation. Um, so... The, the boycott included an economic element and a social element. So the economic element had three key aims. Uh, f- the first one was, uh, or f- three key provisions you could call it, three causes, uh, clauses. So the first one was to forbid anyone doing business with Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. So there was no trade to happen between these tribes and the Muslims. And what this did was it cut, cut off all the livelihood that they had. And it created a situation where it was basically starvation of the Muslims and, and the tribes. Um, these The Muslims and, and these tribes, they were forced to eat tree leaves, really, and camel dung. There was a situation where the you know a Muslim would go out to um, do his business and he would, he'd be um, come across camel dung. And obviously, in his desperation of being starving to death, really, they would take this camel dung and they would wash it and they would kind of try to cook it and eat it because of the nutrients that it may have. SubhanAllah, like, we need to put ourselves in the situation. It wasn't food that had expired or food that had gone off. It was worse than that. It was it was the excrement of camel. It was basically the worst of the worst that they were eating um, just to get the nutritional value and to survive. So this is what the state that the Muslims were in. And, you know, this lasted for a long time. And the only time they gave, got proper provision was when secretly food was being uh, given to them. Uh, and this wasn't very often. It was very difficult. Um, and we'll speak about why. The second thing is that they forbade anyone even outside of the Quraysh to transact with the Muslims and Banu Hashim and Abdul Muttalib, they basically would stop any foreign traders from trading with the, with the Muslims. And one of the things they used to do, is they used to purchase all the goods from the foreign traders, and then they set really high prices that the Muslims couldn't afford. So again, they didn't just not trade with the Muslims, they even forbade anyone else trading with the Muslims. And thirdly, they forbade any gifts being given to the Muslims. So essentially, these three elements cut off every form of sustenance to the Muslims. And they were very serious about it. They didn't want anything to go to the Muslims to starve them to death and to create such a hostile situation that the only choice was to give up the Messenger of so that they could kill him. So you'd think this was enough. But again, there was a social element, a social embargo. Um, they forbade intermarriage between Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. 
with other tribes of Quraysh. So there could be no marriage. And, you know, marriage is a massive part of tribal societies. It, it brought families and tribes together. And it wasn't just an individualistic aim as we see today. You know, marriage, you sometimes look at it in the modern sense where it's just two people. But actually this would bring whole uh, tribes together and families together. And it, and it gave that sense of, uh, well, not just the sense, it gave society uh, security, uh, especially to women who would gain the security of wealth and, um, you know, having a man beside them to to protect them um, and give them children obviously so they even forbade intermarriage um, the other thing they did as part of the social element they would um, or they you know they they would make sure that no mercy could be shown to the Muslims so there could be no reconciliation there could be no um, speaking to the Muslims really and they made it very clear that in this pact there would be no mercy shown to the the Muslims and, and Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib. If this wasn't bad enough, they even forbade anyone from speaking to the Muslims. And they stipulated in the pact, no one can converse with the Muslims or even sit down with them. And why is that? They recognise, the Quraysh, they recognise that if anyone sits with the Muslims, they will have sympathy for the Muslims. And they will want to end the embargo. They'll be able to hear the the Muslim side of the story and it was a form of censorship you could argue if the people uh, didn't hear the side of the Muslims they only get one side of the story they only get the side of the story that the enemies want to say and the Quraysh want to say so the voice of oppression dominates and we find that today don't we that with the media machine well, if it's constantly against Islam and the Muslims you only hear that one side um, because they control that and you know any truth that we want to speak is branded as extreme, branded as um, radical um, because they control those forms and it's a form of censorship. Um, and, you know, we can speak about many examples of where certain things are being censored, whether it be on social media or on TV or anything, even just ourselves wearing certain things and um, saying certain things in public is censored. We can't do it. Um and the final thing that they did as part of the social element, they forbade anyone from entering the homes of the Muslims. They didn't even allow you to enter the home, let alone sit. They didn't even allow you to enter the homes of the Muslims. So again, this was a very comprehensive, com comprehensive social embargo uh, against the Muslims and an economic embargo. Um, and then just to kind of top it all off, they applied a re religious significance to this pact. And how did they do that? They took this pact they put it in a parchment like this cover and they placed it and hung it up in the Kaaba itself to give it some sort of religious credibility that holiness so that Muslims not not just sorry not the Muslims but the non-Muslims who would see this pact would would sense it of a kind of a holy holy pact that they couldn't um, break so this was the boycott and you could really sense how comprehensive it was and how the how the non-Muslims really thought about strategically how they could have maximum impact on the Muslims. So despite all of this, despite um, this very severe embargo being placed on the Muslims and, and, and the tribes of Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam persisted. He continued with his dawah. He was determined and he had that courage and he never weakened. He continued to go to the Kaaba, he continued to pray publicly, he continued to give dawah around the Kaaba to people that would come in to spread his mission. So it really shows that even in this situation, the Messenger of Allah and the Sahaba, they didn't give up, they didn't become defeatist. And after three years had passed um, of this um, embargo, discontent started growing even amongst the members of Quraysh, the, the ones that weren't impacted by the embargo, they started recognising this wasn't fair. And Hisham ibn Amr, he, he was someone who secretly sent food to the Muslims. He, um, he started having sympathy for the Muslims. And he went to Zuhair ibn Abi uh, Umayyah, who was actually part of the same clan of Abu Jahl, uh, Banu Makhzum, but he was related to Banu Abdul Muttalib through his mother. So on his mother's side, he was related. So Hisham, knowing this, he went to Zuhair and he said, Oh Zuhair, 
Are you pleased to eat food, wear clothing and marry women whilst your uncles, who were genuinely related to him, are in the situation you know very well about? Meaning they, they can't do any of this. And um, um, Zuhair, he responded, you know, if, um, sorry, not Zuhair, um, Hisham ibn Amr, he said, you know, if, if we asked Abu Jahal to do the same, he would never agree to it. So how have you agreed to do it? So Zuhair responded to Hisham, he said, Woe to you, Hisham, I'm only one man. What can I do? How can I bring an end to this embargo? By Allah, if I had another man with me, I would stand to nullify this agreement. So then Hisham responded, You do have another man to support you. And Zuhair said, Who? And Hisham responded, Me, I, I will support you. So Zuhair, he then said, Okay, find us a third person. So through the same process, Hisham found Mut'im ibn Adi. Uh, who then said the same thing, said, find us a fourth person. So then Hisham went and found Abu al-Bukhtari. Al Abu al -Bukhtari. And then he said, find a fifth. And it went on and there was five, in the end there were five of them who had, had discontent. And it really shows you that this discontent that they had against this agreement, this pact, wasn't rare. Everyone felt it, but no one was willing to stand up except for when Hisham brought together these people in, into one unit. So they all met up uh, at night in a secret place and they agreed a plan. And then the next morning they went to Kaaba, where, where the leaders were gathered, um, and they separately um, sat down. So they came separately and sat down to avoid any suspicion. So in this uh, meeting, uh, Zuhair spoke out, against his dis you know, spoke out his disapproval of this pact. Um, and Abu Jahal responded and he tried to defend the pact and he said it's needed, the Muslims are causing animosity, we need this pact. But then individually, the other people of the five that they had got in this group, they individually spoke up against the pact. And they were showing their disapproval, their discontent and spoke out against it. And Abu Jahal soon realised that there was a conspiracy here. They, they had all got together and this had already been agreed. So he realized that this discontent was planned. So in the meantime, whilst this was happening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Messenger وسلم, that this pact that was hung up in the Kaaba had been eaten by ants, except for the words Bismillah, the start of the... Um, the because obviously they still believed in Allah, so they, they would start it with Bismillah. Um, and Abu Talib informed the Quraysh of this and said, look, this is what has happened to your pact. It's been eaten. And they laughed and they said, no chance, this couldn't happen. How would Muhammad Sassam know this? It's, it's been in the Kaaba, no one's touched it, no one's even seen it. It's in this parchment. So when uh, they laughed and they said, look, if you're right, then we agree to uh, end the pact. But if you're wrong, then give us Muhammad Sassam and, and would allow us to kill him. So Abu Talib, being confident in what the Messenger Sassam said, agreed. And to their amazement, to their astonishment, what the Messenger Sallallahu said about the agreement being eaten by the ants except for the words Bismillah had occurred. And when they saw that they're astonished and shocked and you would have hoped there'd be some sincerity where they think there may be must there must be some truth to what the Messenger Sallallahu had said. However, because of their arrogance, their pride, they didn't believe. <laughs> they they claimed that this was magic. And it just really shows you that despite any miracle that was placed in front of them, they will never believe. Even the greatest miracle, as we spoke about in previous episodes of the Quran itself, they just have that seal over their hearts. No ounce of sincerity and that pride that you know means that they will never accept Islam. So, what can just to kind of conclude the session or bring it to the end? Really, uh, what lessons can we take from this embargo and this pact? One number one, really, I think the most important lesson is that. This pact and agreement was rigorously well thought out by the Quraysh. It was a, it was a very comprehensive strategy to maximize the impact against the Muslims. We went through the pact and if you look closely at the declaration, you can see that they've thought about every single element to intensify and have the maximum impact. So no sustenance getting through. Every form of sustenance is blocked no verbal contact so that there's no sympathy that is brought about so that the pact comes to an end no marriage so that if for example obviously if you marriage if you get married to people of 
uh, that aren't part of the tribes and the Muslims, then there's going to be links and there's going to be relationships where um, you know non-Muslims may want to not want to see the other side of the family going through the boycott, and this could bring an end. So they said no marriage. So they thought about every single element in society, economic, political, social, so that they could have an intensified impact on the Muslims and and so that it would maximise the length of the pact. And it lasted for three whole years, which is a long time for, for how severe the pact was. Um, and it's a clear comparison we can make with today. You know, the enemies of Islam today, they spend their millions to develop strategies to hamper the and harm the revival of Islam. You know, with their sanctions, they've paralyzed entire nations. Um, with their destruction, with their chaos, they've brought a standstill to a lot of the revival occurring in the Muslim lands. Because, they've, you know, they recognize that Muslims are reviving, but they couldn't see, they didn't want to see this revival, so they tried to uh, delay it. Whether it be through sanctions, destruction, chaos, you can see most of the Muslim world is in destruction. And what recently, many of you may have seen, there was this report released which stated that uh, at a minimum, at the bare minimum, 37 million people have been displaced through America's war on terror, which in reality is a war on Islam. And that's an eye-watering figure. 37 million displaced due to the actions of America since the war on Islam. And just think about the impact that's had on the Muslims and that comparison we can make when you think about some of those videos we saw at the height of the Syrian war where children were eating leaves to survive because they were being starved to death due to that siege mentality siege environment created by America in our lands and again it's just you can make that clear comparison to the Muslims who are eating leaves and eating camel dung we have faced it today and and you know a, a grander scale so that's number one, that the enemies of Islam really want to think about every single way they can have a well thought out strategy to harm Islam. Number two, what the when the, the pact came to an end, it, rec it really shows how there is goodness in people, even if they're not Muslim. There is goodness and there is sincerity amongst people. But the problem we have is that the system that dominates prevails and it has its checks and balances so even though people may um, have sympathy with Muslims um, have sympathy against the oppression of the Palestinians for example and there's people that will even want to speak out against it you find that they're limited to the system they're limited to lobbying or charity or uh, speaking to the MP and whatever it may be embargo boycott these are ideas they you know they do they're doing their best but they, they, it's difficult because it's such a grand scale uh, that we face today. It's difficult to bring an end to some of the oppression that's being caused. But you see that the, there are attempts, like Hisham. He had the he he had the willingness to find five people to bring this embargo to an end, and he did have sympathy for the Muslims. Number three, the enemies are willing to give up on their principles to attack Islam and to attack the truth. The Quraysh, the reality is the Quraysh were known for their hospitality and goodness. Even though, you know, when we think about Quraysh, we, we think about their harshness towards the Muslims. In reality, before Islam, they were known to be the ones who would uh, be the custodians of the Kaaba and host the Hujjaj and cater for their needs. And, and their hospitality was known amongst all the Arabs. And they also, the Arabs in large and the Quraysh, they had very strong tribal connections. And they do everything to protect the Quraysh. And this was massive for them. But due to their deep hatred for Islam, their deep hatred for the Messenger's mission and the truth, they were willing to declare such an agreement that would go against all their values and traits that they had. You know, And even though non-Muslims would see this, not non-Muslims, sorry, the non-Quraysh would see this, other people that came to Hajj, they would see what the Quraysh are doing. They weren't bothered because they had such a hatred for Islam and the threat of Islam that they were willing to do something that would bring it bring it to an end or try to bring it to an end. And again, we can make that comparison with uh, the enemies of today. They claim to be tolerant. They came, claim to be 
accepting of all ways and you know they polite and all of this but because of their hatred against islam they will never accept the values of islam and they will mock those values and they will insult the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam they will draw cartoons of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam they will burn the quran they will shred up the quran all of this because of their hatred of islam and they call this freedom of expression freedom of speech but when it comes to other things for example denial of the holocaust or speaking out against the actions of their armies they would criminalize it criminalize this you can't do this illegal to say this because their values and things they believe in can't be criticized but when it comes to us and our values and islam we're a free free game we're open game you know they can do what they want and this is just really shows that when it comes to the truth when it comes to islam enemies of today like the enemies of the past they will give up all their values and principles because the threat of islam and the threat of the truth is far greater so number 4 what we found during the situation of the pact and the embargo the muslims and the messenger of allah alayhi wasallam they continued with their mission they had that sabr they they were ordered by the messenger of allah alayhi wasallam not to fight back and become angry so they had patience even though the situation was dire like we were explaining they persevered and they were led by example by the messenger of allah alayhi wasallam who went to the center of kaaba and gave his da'wah and continued and again this is something that we should recognize in the situation that we find ourselves we need to have sabr we need to recognize that it will get harder it will be difficult for many of us in different ways but we need to stick to the quran and the sunnah uh, number 5 is that we we saw you know with when the quraysh did this embargo and this hostility uh, there was a positive impact on the dawa because a lot of non um, quraysh people that would uh, would see the embargo and the imp- impact on banu hashim and banu abdul muttalib and muslims they started opening their hearts to the muslims and having sympathy for the muslims and this reached uh, them and the fact that they would actually come and try to listen to what the messenger of allah had to say because of this embargo because they had that empathy and that sympathy for the muslims and the final thing we mentioned already number 6 was that despite clear miracles and pl- clear proofs being brought forward to the enemies of islam they will continue to blindly follow their desires and call it magic and call it whatever they want because they have that pride and arrogance never to accept islam and this we can see clearly from the incident of when the ants ate the you know they they did what the messenger sallam said and he had no knowledge except that allah told him but they yet didn't believe and they just called it magic so just before we bring it to an end i think it's valuable to speak about something that's slightly linked to this you know we're speaking about economic boycotts and trade dealings um and i think it's worth speaking about some of the recent events we've seen uh happen in the last few weeks really and what i'm speaking about is the normalize normalization deals that both uh, uae and bahrain have shamelessly signed with israel uh facilitated by the us we should add really um you know i think it's worth just highlighting um some of the arguments being used for this and some of the political significance of this as well um given you know we're talking about the sira and i've always mentioned in my episodes and something that we always mention every episode really is that any action we see and action any action we do has has to be linked back to the quran and the sunnah and what we find is many people are use the sira not many actually i wouldn't say many i would say some people use the sira um incorrectly whether it's intentional or not incorrectly they use it uh, to justify certain things so 99% of the muslims have seen this normalization for really what it is they see it as a treachery against palestine and the muslims um but then you have a few voices um who are in support of normalization um and and they might not directly say it but they indirectly support it and i spoke about it already today you know you have certain scholars uh who have supported the deal and also support uh the regimes for what they've done and one of the key arguments they use from the sira that i think it's worth highlighting and clarifying is that they say that it is okay for muslims to deal with non-muslims 
and have dealings and treaties because the Prophet وسلم, had dealings with the Jews and also he signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah with the Quraysh. And look, we're going to speak about this in further detail when we come to that because this part of the Sira and it's very important for the Dawah actually. It was, it was, a, it was a massive uh, event in, in Sira that aided Islam. But we need to speak about it in the correct context and I want to provide a few pointers uh, as, we speak, as we see all this normalization going on. I think it's worth highlighting so that you're aware of the arguments when you hear it and you're able to clarify to other people why this normalization is against Islam. And Sheikh Azra Rashid, he even said, you know, anyone who says normalization with Israel is like Hudaybiyah has not understood the Sira. He's 100% correct when he said that. Um, so let's make a few comparisons of why it's not like Hudaybiyah. So the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, in short, basically was a treaty between the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his capacity as a leader of the newly established Islamic State in Medina. Yeah? It was a treaty between him as the, as the leader of the Muslims in Medina with the Quraysh of Mecca. The UAE, Israel and the Bahrain, Israel normalization agreements, they are between the UAE and Bahrain, who, which they aren't Islamic states. They are not, they're definitely not representative of the Muslims, they haven't been authorized by the Muslims, so they're not a legal, Islamically recognized um, leadership. We, the Muslim Ummah, doesn't recognize them as the leaders of the Muslims. Between them and with Israel, who are occupying Muslim land. So that's the difference, right? Number one from that, just to clarify, a subcategory of that is normalization is not the same as a treaty. So the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a treaty. It wasn't normalization because there was no there was no occupation occurring as well. But the but the normalization that is occurring between UAE and Israel and Bahrain and Israel is in fact is it says it in the name is it's normalization, it's recognition of the criminal entity of Israel, recognition of the occupation and accepting the occupation. Um, and we found that Israel has continued to bomb and they will continue to annex following this deal. And number two, the UAE and Saudi or Bahrain, none of them are an authority for the Muslims. They don't represent the Muslims. Whereas the Messenger وسلم, of course, he did represent the Muslims. As a, as a, in his capacity as a leader, he made the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So clearly it shows that these two th agreements, this this the tr Treaty of Hudaybiyah is very different from the normalization agreements that we see. Number two, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was an example of political astuteness from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to paralyze the Quraysh from joining forces with the Jews of Khaybar. Because what he did, it said, you cannot join any forces, you, you cannot attack the Muslims. Yes, there were certain short-term parts uh, elements to the agreement but it didn't allow them to join forces with the Jews of Khaybar and it allowed for the Dawah to actually spread and it was a victory for Islam so what many people don't know is that after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah only 15 days later it allowed the Messenger of Salman, the Messenger of Salman did he attacked the Jews of Khaybar for their conspiring against the Muslims so <laughs> ironically with the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, we were attacking those who were causing um, animosity against the Muslims or conspiring against the Muslims. Whereas the normalization, in fact, normalizes, as the word suggests, the oppression of the Muslims and the conspiring against the Muslims. So, with one Treaty of Hudaybiyah being a victory, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it, Al Fath, he described it as a victory. Um, whereas the UAE and Bahrain normalization is in fact a treachery and, and in no way a victory for Islam and the Muslims. And number three, to finally conclude and put it to bed, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Quraysh were in control of Mecca. They didn't occupy the land because that land was never the Muslims. And the Muslims had not yet con conquered that land or liberated that land. Whereas, as I've said, Israel is an occupying force. 
they're occupying the blessed land of Palestine and Beit al Maqdis. It's a clear aggression that as Muslims you cannot normalize. In the Sharia, we have to liberate this land and we have to remove the occupying forces. And it's not about bringing an end to persecution. Some people have said, oh, this deal would stop annexation and it would stop the persecution. Firstly, it hasn't stopped that. But let's say it did. Let's say it, bring, it, bring, it brought an end to persecution of the Palestinians. The fact and reality of the matter is, it's not even that, that is not even the issue. The issue isn't persecution. That's a sub-outcome of what's happening. The, the core issue is occupation. And only when this occupation is lifted and it's liberated from the oppressors and the occupiers is when the Muslims will be happy. So we just need to make it clear. This is a political action that the UAE and Bahrain are doing that in reality has been aided by the enemies of Islam, both Israel and America. So any Muslim would realize that this is not in aid of Islam. In fact, it is a treachery against Islam and the Muslims. And this agreement, in fact, this normalization will allow for America to implement its broader plan for Palestine, which is the deal of the century. Um, and this deal really surrenders the whole of Palestine to Israel. And this is this normalization that's occurring and may, more may occur, in fact, enables this. So inshallah, I pray that we've highlighted this um, and it gives a bit more clarity on the issue. And we as Muslims, we need to continue. And alhamdulillah, the Muslims have shown that they are against this, which is brilliant, which is which is a blessing, which is, you know, alhamdulillah, we do have Muslims that are sincere and recognize for what it really is. So we continue. We need to continue to raise our voices and make sure that we don't accept this. So inshallah, I won't take any much more t uh, time. We've gone over the hour, I think. Um, and we've made some clear comparisons with the, our, our reality today based on what happened in terms of the boycott um, and the fact that, uh, that the Islam of Omar and Hamza. Inshallah, um, we've covered loads and, and I just pray that you've all benefited and you know, again, please share with others uh, that may benefit from this, and follow and subscribe to all our social media channels. Uh, would you know? Would really appreciate your support. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.